Just tell me when I'm ready to rock. All right, good evening, everybody. We're going to move this up a little bit. Get started. That was really fast silence. Wow, that was impressive. I got to bring you into my classes and have you demonstrate that. That was fast. Um, <clears throat> welcome tonight. Um, thank you. Uh, Danny, would you mind uh, shutting that door back there and just making sure that that magnets over the strike plate so it can open? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Um, a few quick commercials and uh, if you happen to eat at the Park Place Diner anytime soon, you'll see us on the placemat. I hope you got a chance cool. to see that. Yeah, it looks really good. Did not plan for it to be dead center in the middle, but that was the Lord just stuck it right in the middle there. So that's pretty good. And that'll be there, I think, till June. I think we have about three or four months. So I think that's till June. So that's exciting. Um, I'll tell you one township that has no excuse. Aberdeen and Matawan has no excuse, I'll tell you that. Um, but anyway, uh, some stuff coming up tomorrow. We have the youth group getting together at my house at 7 o'clock. Um, just come one, come all. Uh, bring your Bible questions. We'll get into the Word, have some food, have some games, enjoy some time together. Uh, and then also at 7 o'clock, for those that are not youth group but still want to get together, we have the rescue mission at Asbury at 7 o'clock. Uh, pray for that meeting. Pete Whalen is the preacher, so pray for him. Um, next week on the 19th, we have a men's meeting. Uh, on that Friday, that's, um, I think we're going to do that at Mike's house. And then the 26th of this month, we have a ladies fellowship. My wife will give some more details about that. Also, um, I did send out an evite about the breakfast in May with the Spurgeons. I'm also going to send one out about the, um, the church in the park. So that weekend of the 18th and the 19th, hopefully you can s carve some time out. We'll have breakfast here with Dave and Sue Spurgeon um, in the morning. Um, we'll meet in the cafeteria, we'll have breakfast, then we'll separate. The ladies will come in here, and Sue will speak to the ladies, and Dave will speak to the guys. And then uh, on that Sunday, we'll be going to Homedale Park, Church in the Park, our usual spot, and Dave Spurgeon is going to be our guest speaker uh, that morning. Um, I'm also going to be talking to people that are going to camp about uh, just uh, settling up with that, you know, in terms of payment um, and some ideas about that. So I will share some information about that coming up soon. I have one announcement that's really big, really big. I was told this when I was getting ready to get into church today. I was told that today is Deborah's birthday. So uh, made you nervous, <laughs> All right? So um, it, we're breaking protocol here. We're going rogue here. We're making a dispensational exclusion, an exception here to have to sing on a Thursday for Deborah. But I was asked by special request, I won't tell you who, but Victoria said, you know, can we, can we sing for my mom on a Thursday? I had to call headquarters, speak to the synod, get in touch with the cardinal. You know, and, you know, no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> get a special dispensation. Uh, but anyway, yeah, we're gonna we'll sing Happy Birthday for Deborah. Unless you want us to sing it again on Sunday, I could do it again on Sunday. But I'll do it tonight, right? Ready? Help me out. Both. both. Why not? Hey. Sure thing, Cardinal. All right. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Deborah. Happy birthday to you. On the second. Happy birthday to you. Only one will not do. Born again means salvation. How many have you? Happy birthday, dear sister. Everybody at home, I didn't hear you singing. So next time, I want to hear it a little louder, especially you tenors. All right, so uh, some things to pray about. Do pray for uh, Deborah's mom, Barbara. We tend to pray for that situation. Is she not in yet, or she is in? She's in, but she's not doing well. So pray for, um, pray for Barbara. Uh, she's currently at Spring Hills. Uh, things aren't going too hot, so I know there's some doctors and things that have to happen. So pray for that situation. Pray for our missionaries, Maurice. Haven't heard from him in, um, in about a week or so, so I need to reach out to Maurice again. He's been just kind of lay low and kind of see how it's unfolding there. Um, pray for other missionaries, Adam Zander in Romania, Anil in Pakistan, um, and um, 
think those are the our main guys. Obviously, Nini in, in the Philippines. Pray also for Michael and Carla Wood. These are Eleanor and John's son and uh, daughter-in-law ministering in the Philippines in a pretty, pretty, uh, I want to say dangerous, but a tenuous area where there's a lot of radicals and a lot of like uh, Muslim activity and they ministered to Muslim children in a school. And when there was Eid yesterday, uh, which is the breaking of Ramadan, that big holiday for them, there was some gunfire and uh, they're again, they're, they're kind of stepping away because they have an extended holiday out there. So they're going to go to Iligan, that's the city where Nini is, and just kind of get away from the hot spot for a little while. Uh, but it's, it's been kind of a lot of that back and forth. So just pray for Mike and Carla Wood as they're out there. So, um, and there's a lot of stuff to pray for Tuesday night. We had a long list, so I'm not going to go over that list, but those are some of the big things right now. So um, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into our, our study. All right. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you for the Lord Jesus and for this precious book, Lord. We know so little of it, Father, but we endeavor to learn you more, Father. Not that we might be full of knowledge, Lord, but that we might know the author better, Father. We might appreciate him more, love him more. I appreciate the love he has for us, Lord, and the great plan he has unfolding now and has yet to unfold, Lord. Just open the eyes of our understanding, Father. I know Jude is, is a tough book, and uh, we ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, you give us insight and understanding. We pray for our missionaries, Lord, Maurice and Neil, Nini, Adam, Lord, just those folks that are going around the world. And pray, Lord, for uh, Deborah's mom, Barbara, Father, for her soul, first of all, Lord, that she might be saved. Lord, we pray for just wisdom for Deborah. She works out all the details of the care that her mom needs, Father. Give her a plain path. Lord, we think of, uh, of Mark, Father, just uh, on his bed of affliction, Lord, Ron's brother, Father. Um, we think of just your family in Christ tonight, Lord, the many needs that are known and unknown, Father. Just give your best answer in that regard, Father, and just pray it open your eyes of our understanding again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. There was something I wanted to say, and I forgot what it was. Completely forgot, so I guess I'm going to have to jump in here. I guess it wasn't important. What? There is no rain date. There's no, they don't allow us to have a rain date. They take our money and uh, say, pray. I don't know. I bring a chair. We'll, we'll work on it. We'll bring a chair or something like that. We'll figure something out. We'll, um... All right, so we'll open up to the book of Jude. Oh, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, before I just jump into the message, I have, the Lord willing, one more book in the Bible to do after this week, Revelation. Uh, so next week, Lord willing, we'll finish the Bible. So if you want to start compiling questions you've had, I would like to take a week or two or three, depending on how many, just for you to have a space to ask those questions. We haven't done a question and answer night in many, many months or weeks, so I'd like to leave a little space one week, two weeks, depending on how many questions come in, for people just to have a little venue to ask some questions and ask me questions and kind of get some of the questions answered. Having come through the whole Bible, what are some maybe questions you've compiled from your own reading, from our study, just to give that spot there. And then after that, we're going to just maybe go in another direction. I might start talking about uh, the dispensations, and now that we've laid a framework, try to maybe put the sheetrock on the walls and wiring and all the plumbing and just kind of continue to build the house, so to speak, uh, of the Word of God. So we're in the book of Jude now. Um, and Jude has got, as you see on your sheet, if you got a sheet, one chapter, 25 verses, 608 words. The author is Jude. Um, you see it right there. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. We dated approximately 66 to 69 A.D. We'll talk about where we get that date from in a second. And we're not exactly sure which Jude it is. So um, it says, um, Jude, um, what's up guys? Jude the servant, is that Matt Bowman? Oh my goodness. Wow, my cold shower friend. All right, uh, Jude there is. Jude the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now, Jude was the brother of James. We get that much because the Bible says that much. But there are two gentlemen in your Bible that have that description. So there's kind of two schools of thought as to who this Jude actually is. Uh, the one is it's Judas the Apostle, who is also called Thaddeus. He's the brother of James, the son of Alphaeus. The book of Luke talks about that. Luke 6 and Acts 1 talks about Judas the Apostle or Thaddeus the Apostle. That's who some people think 
Judas could be, or Jude could be. The other competing thought is that Jude, Jude is Judas, the Lord's brother, Jesus Christ's brother, who also had a brother named James. The Bible is written in such a way, just if, you don't, if you're not diligent with it, it just makes your head spin around, right? So um, I lean that way for this reason. Look at Jude verse 17. So we got these two competing thoughts, right? Is Jude the apostle Judas? Is it Jesus' brother, Judas? Um, and here's why I lean that it could be the brother of, of, of the Lord, right? Um, Jude 17 says this, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Now he's talking there at the, of the apostles as somebody not including himself. So it seems the author Jude is not an apostle, that he's talking about the apostles as a group distinct from who he is. I'll sh hold your place and go to 2 Peter 3. I'll show you a comparison here. 2 Peter 3, verse 2. <clears throat> 2 Peter 3, verse 2. Peter's writing and he says, that ye may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So Peter makes it very clear that I'm one of the apostles as he talks about the apostles. Jude is very different. He's talking about the apostles as like a separate group of people. So that makes me think that Jude was not one of the apostles, that I think he was probably the Lord's brother. Now, it's impossible to tell for sure. And honestly, it doesn't change anything about the book, really, as you interpret it and break it down. So I'm not going to fight you on it. That's my two cents. It seems very much that Jude, the author, was heavily influenced by 2 Peter. There's a lot of references to 2 Peter and Jude. A lot of the ideas of 2 Peter show up in Jude. So 2 Peter's written 66 A.D., so that's why we date the book of Jude sometime after that, probably around 66, the earliest, possibly 69 A.D., somewhere in that span is where people date the book. Uh, the big idea, the, did I write the context on your sheet? I don't think I wrote that, right? I didn't write context. The context of the book, right? The context of the book is the danger of apostasy. All right? The danger of apostasy. The danger of apostasy among God's people. I just want you to get this. Jude is where we live. Jude is where we live. We're living the book of Jude right now. And it's interesting. Jude is all about apostasy, right? What's after Jude? Revelation. Jesus shows up. And as we live in this age of apostasy, this Laodicean falling away, which the book of Jude is all about, guess what's next? the coming of the Lord. Amen. So the way the books are laid out actually tell a story. You've seen the rapture happen, right, in the, in the end books of Paul. Then you saw Hebrews. We made that turn to the Jews, to the tribulation. We've seen one thing bad after another. Now Jude is like rock bottom, apostasy, ungodly teachers. He's just naming all the bad guys in the Bible. He's really laying it on here. And what happens after Jude? What happens after we hit the rock bottom of apostasy? The Lord appears. That's the way your Bible's laid out. He's revealed after the apostasy. So get this idea out of your mind. You know, if you turn on TBN or whatever those things are, you turn on those Christian TV shows, they make you think there's a, the latter rain is coming and the great revival that's happening. There's no great revival, people. That's right. That's right. You can have revival in a church, and I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. Deborah, no offense. But I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but the reality is the church age ends in apostasy. But you could be a Philadelphian Christian in the apostate age, and we'll get to that at the end. So, um, now listen, God's been leading us to this point. Matthew 24, we don't have to flip there. But in Matthew 24, Jesus Christ warned against false prophets that would arise. He said, they're coming, guys. And for all of you that freaked out about the shake, rattle, and roll and the eclipse, that was a giant nothing burger, right? All that stuff was in Matthew 24. That's about the tribulation, right? So don't pull that stuff out of context and forget how your Bible's putting together. But he said, in that time to come, there will be all these false prophets would arise. Acts chapter 20, Paul is warning the elders of Ephesus that wolves would draw away disciples after themselves. But he speaks about it future. 
Okay? Second Peter. Go back to, you're in Second Peter, right? Look at chapter 2. Second Peter 2. <clears throat> this is the only building in the school that has the heat on. Just want you to know that. As you see me wiping my brow and having all the windows open, everywhere else has the air conditioning on. This is the one. All right, Second Peter uh, 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall. You see all the shalls, all the future tense? Shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So... Jesus warned against them coming. Paul warns against them coming. Peter's prophesying of false teachers that would lead others to destruction. So they're all looking ahead a little bit. But if you go to 1 John chapter 2, by the time we get to the letters of, 1, of John and Jude, these warnings have come to pass. Right? All this stuff has hit the proverbial fan and it's all just falling apart in front of you. Look at 1 John 2. Look what he says in verse 18. He says, Little children, present tense, it is the last time. And as ye have heard past that Antichrist shall come, even now are present tense. There are many Antichrists whereby we know that it is present tense the last time. Amen. Chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit. But try the spirits, whether they are present tense of God, because many false prophets are present tense, gone out into the world. 2 John, 2 John, verse 7. One more verse on this. Notice again, he says, 2 John 7, For many deceivers are, right now, entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus has come in the flesh. This is, present tense, a deceiver and an antichrist. So those deceivers had already entered into the world. They were there when John is writing. And they're there prophetically when he's writing about that tribulation. That's what's happening in that, what he's looking ahead to, as if it's happening right now. Now go to Jude 4. Jude 4. Again, there's no chapters, just one chapter in Jude. So Jude verse 4, the Bible says... Remember, Paul warned about it. Jude's talking about them like they're there. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So evil men had crept in otherwares, meaning without warning, they'd infiltrated. So historically, this was happening in the first century. The early church was full of false doctrine, false teachers, guys trying to infiltrate the churches and create their own little sects. So there's a historical application. But doctrinally, this points to the tribulation when the Antichrist is on the scene and lies and false teachers will abound. So give yourself a little context there. Key word is the word keep. That's the key word. It appears two times. Keep. Because the enemy is trying to steal something from you. The enemy's trying to get you to fall from something, so you got to keep something, hold on to something in the book of Jude. Verse 3 is the key verse. This is the real key of the whole book. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That is the message of the book. Earnestly contend, stand up for um, proclaim, fight for, defend, if you will, the doctrines that we've been given. Amen. That's the faith. And the Lord Jesus Christ is always pictured as something. In here, He's pictured as our keeper. The Psalm 121 says, The Lord is thy keeper. Right? So He's going to keep us. So the breakdown is pretty easy. The first four verses are the command. 5 to 19 is the caution. And 20 to 25 is the comfort. So let's jump in now a little bit. Let's talk about some big truths and ideas in the book of Jude, all right? Number one, first big idea I want to talk about is the necessity, all right? The necessity of contending for the faith. Why is it such a big deal to God? Like, why write a whole book about 
standing up for and holding on to the doctrines that we're supposed to believe, like the eternal security, salvation by grace through faith, the deity of Christ, the premillennial return of Christ. All these doctrines are eroding all around you. I know you live in a bubble, especially my guys that grew up in First Bible. You live in a bubble. You live in a bubble where Wayne Weckman used to say you got served filet mignon your whole life. Because that's what we got served in First Bible. From Mel Savaka on down to Pastor Dean, Pastor Mike, we just get filet mignon. That's all we've been served is sound doctrine, rightly divided, put out there beautifully for us. But if you step outside the confines of our little paradise, Christians don't know anything. They don't know who Jesus is. They're not sure if they're saved. They're not sure how to get saved. Like, and that's not strange. That's the norm. You're the oddball. Everybody else is just like, we're just going to share today. Like, share what? I don't know. We're just going to share something. All right. Now, look at the necessity here. Jude 3, he says this. Look at Jude 3. He says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, meaning I wanted to write to you about salvation, but he says, it was needful for me to write unto you. So he kind of changes pace. He says, I wanted to write this to you, but I had to write something else to you. I was compelled to warn you. That's the Holy Spirit saying, like, I'd like it to all be sugary and sweet and sugar and spice and everything nice, but I got to warn you. And that's the Lord just warning us. Verse 4, he says there, these ungodly men are infiltrating. Right. I, he's like, I need you to know I need to write to you because you got ungodly men all around you that are trying to infiltrate your churches and corrupt God's people. Now go to Second Timothy three. Paul talked about this also, this infiltration that would come in the last days. Second Timothy, hold your place, stick something like your, your neighbor in, uh, in Jude and just look at Second Timothy three <clears throat> and look at verse six. Again, he's talking about the last days of the church, if you look at verse 1. So, 2 Timothy 3, 6, he talks about the church. He says, for of this sort, and if you look at verse 5, these are people that have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. For of this sort are they which creep into houses. That's not a guy trying to rob your house. That's a guy trying to sneak into your church, <laughs> right? The house of God is the church. He says... Um, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. God already told you that people would try to infiltrate the church. Now listen, once so long ago, when you thought for those first two weeks in March of 2020, when you thought the air was going to kill you, you did everything you could to not breathe it, right? You were wrapping stuff around your head, buying respirators. You know, you go out to the store, walk into the garage, strip yourself naked, spray yourself down with a hazmat thing. I don't know, we did, everybody did all kinds of stuff. For me, that lasted about two weeks. Maybe some of you are still doing it. God bless you. But it lasted about two weeks. Everybody just, I mean, I mean we didn't know what we were dealing with. We didn't know if you went outside, you were holding your breath. I don't know, you were afraid. I remember when I went to Haiti and you took a shower, they were like, don't let the water get in your mouth. Those were some funky showers we were taking, you know. It was like doing like this, you know, with your mouth shut, with taping our mouth shut. Don't know, cold water too. I mean, just it was it was crazy. When you thought, I remember taking those showers in Haiti. They said, "Don't let that water get in you, man. You're gonna get the you're gonna get sick." But but we close our mouth. We just turn away. You wouldn't let it infiltrate. You know, people were wearing stuff on their face because they didn't want that to infiltrate because they thought it's gonna hurt me. Folks, the Lord's telling you these teachers are coming. The Lord's telling you they're going to infiltrate. He's telling you they're going to get in there. We should be protecting ourselves. The way we protected ourselves against a virus or against water that might give us dysentery, you should be protecting yourselves and your churches against the infiltration that the Lord said is coming. He's like, it's coming, it's going to happen, and it's coming to fruition all around you. Now look at verse 5. Here's why you have to protect yourself so much. right? Because now we're going to see the necessity of contending, and then we see the effect of apostasy. That's the second, the effect of apostasy. He says in verse 5, oh, go back to Jude, I'm sorry, go back to Jude. Take your neighbor's hand out of Jude and find Jude again. Jude 5, 
I will therefore put you in remembrance. Though once he knew this. So he's like, I'm going to give you some examples from the Bible to caution you that apostasy is possible. It's possible among God's people. And the examples I give you are to impress upon you the effects, the awful effects of apostasy. The awful effects of God's people falling away from the truth after this corrupting influence gets in there and a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Just let a little bit in there and it'll destroy you. I'll show you some of that. Let's look at Jude. First example. He says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, we're going back to Exodus 12 now, salvation by the blood of a lamb. He says, afterward destroyed them that believed not. First thing we see is the corruption of unbelievers among God's people. The corruption of unbelievers among God's people. You know, in Exodus 12 it says, not everybody that came out of Egypt believed God. The Bible calls them a mixed multitude, right? Exodus 12 says, a mixed multitude went up also with them. There were unbelievers in that crowd. There were some people in that crowd that just didn't want to get whacked by God. They said, you guys are getting out of here. I'm going with you. <laughs> I watched the plagues. I lost my crops. I lost my firstborn son. You guys have the way out of here. And they just followed to save their skin, not because they loved God and wanted to worship Him. They were unbelievers in the midst. Numbers 11 says, the mixed multitude that was among them fell a-lusting. So those unbelievers in their midst began to infect them. Because that's what unbelief does, you know. It, it infects people. It's like a cancer. It's like a virus. It just spreads. You know, your unbelief will affect somebody else, and your unbelief will affect somebody else. And by the time they get to Kadesh Barnea, the whole congregation, except for two guys, are ready to give up because they don't believe that the God who opened the Red Sea could take care of the giants. Amen. That unbelief that just followed them began to eat away at them, and eventually that generation missed the promised land as God's judgment fell upon them. Why? Because they didn't believe. It wasn't mixed with faith. And God is showing you the corrupting power of unbelievers among God's people. That's the first illustration or example of the effect of falling away. The second one is right there in verse 6. It's the corruption. So we got the first one is unbelievers. The second one is evil angels. See that? He says, <clears throat> and the angels which kept not their first estate. What's the first estate of an angel? Their spirit, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire. Hebrews 1.14 says angels are spirit beings, but angels, I know it's going to make your head spin, have the power to take on flesh. They can leave that estate. The sons of God, lowercase s, could take on flesh. Like the Son of God, capital S, took on flesh. Right? They could take on flesh too. Clearly it says they left their first estate. They left that spirit being. They took on flesh. Psalm 82 says, he says, I've said your gods and ye shall die like men. Right? God prophesied that some of His angels would die like men because they would take on flesh. And we know the story. In Genesis 3, God promises a seed would bruise the serpent's head. Right? Hallelujah. <laughs> I think there's a song about that, right? Um, that they would bruise the serpent's head, and what happens? All the devils said, oh, okay, I guess we're beat. I guess we'll just give up. No. They get up there, and those angels that are following Satan, what do they do? They co-mingle with the women to corrupt the seed. They're going after the seed. They didn't just go after those girls because they liked their hairstyle. They were going after those girls because they wanted to destroy the seed and make it so God could never bring forth a Messiah from the seed of a woman because I'll corrupt all the seed of women and make sure that there's no way that Messiah could be born. Amen. And so in Genesis 6, those evil angels are taking on flesh to pollute the seed, corrupting influence. And what do they do? They ruin the whole world. Their offspring brought violence to this world that God had to flood it. Genesis 7, God's judgment falls during that flood and only eight souls are saved. What is God doing here? He's showing you illustration after illustration about the awful effect of that little bit of leaven. Leavening the whole lump. Those angels came down and sowed that seed and destroyed the world. And He gives you one more. 
And I'm definitely going to get a strike for this one. Jude 7. <clears throat> Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, that doesn't mean they were hooking up with funny looking people, right? That means they were hooking up with people that they shouldn't be hooking up with. And it says, strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The last example is not the corruption of unbelievers or the corruption of evil angels. It's the corruption of perverts among God's purpose. Right? The unbelievers, they corrupted God's people. The evil angels corrupted, tried to corrupt God's plan. And the perverts corrupt God's purpose. And what did God make them in the, in the beginning? Male and female. Binary. Binary, right? Male and female created He them. For what purpose? For a purpose. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. You can't do that if you got the wrong plumbing. No matter how much you want to think or believe or identify, I like when I see these like, these same-sex couples say, like, we had a child together. No, you didn't, all right? I learned enough in ninth grade about biology that you had to outsource that, okay? You had to outsource that baby and get it somewhere else because there's no way that those ends are going to make a child, right? And I'm not trying to be crude, but sometimes we've got to get shaken out of it, right? We're so used to swimming in this sewer of ideas. Go to Romans chapter 1. Here we come. Community strike. Romans 1. So, male and female created he them for a purpose, to be fruitful and multiply. So what happens in Sodom? The men of Sodom, the Bible says, burned in their lust one for another. Romans 1 talks about that. Talks about that. He talks about that as part of the downward spiral of a society. And that's what Jude is all about. Jude is about 2024, 20, people. It's about the downward spiral of a society of God's people, of a nation, of a culture. It's the absolute degradation of a people and a culture and a society has turned away from God. And now you're seeing that law of sowing and reaping exploding in the book of Jude. It's exploding all over the place. You see unbelief, you see apostasy, and it says right there, uh, Romans 1.27, Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of the error which was meat. So what happens? What goes on? We know what goes on. Genesis 19, verses 24 to 25, God's judgment falls on those five cities, not just Sodom and Gomorrah, there were five cities that were destroyed because of their perversion. Can I just say this to anybody listening or watching? Wake up, America. Wake up. Wake up. I'm not hateful. I'm not advocating hating anybody. I wouldn't raise my hand against anybody unless they tried to touch or hurt my children or my friends. I'm not saying that. But you are living in a fantasy land if you think, well, what goes on behind closed doors? As long as they're not hurting anybody. Right. No, man. That's right. That is a symptom of a nation that has gone so far from God that they start calling evil good and good evil. And God says, when you get to that point, you're toast. Amen. You're done. <laughs> That's what God's saying. People say, why do you Christians get so uptight about that sin? Isn't all sin sin? Yes. Lying will get you to hell just like any other sin will get you to hell. But that sin is a barometer of a nation so far gone they've become reprobate. That's why we get so alarmed by it. When you see a nation celebrating and waving it around and legalizing and calling evil good, that's a chance you better step back because God's about to strike. You, you, know, you know what I heard a preacher say? You know what America's biggest enemy is right now? America's biggest enemy is not Palestinians or Ukrainians or Russians. America's biggest enemy today is God Almighty. Because we have thumbed our nose at God so much. We've done such despite to His grace and His goodness that we all need to duck because He's about to swing. I think He's going to get us out of here before He really swings, but that swing is coming. You cannot institutionally just praise the wicked and celebrate iniquity, and we are the propagators of that perversion around the world. 
Haitians have more morals than Americans when it comes to that stuff. I heard out of their own mouths. They say they don't stand for that stuff like we stand for it, like we celebrate it, like we put it out there. We're the ones promoting it around the world. Scary stuff. Look at, go back to Jude. I got on a thing. Uh, Jude. I know, probably get some hate, something or other, you know. But I mean, it's just, look, we want people to get saved. Nobody has any ill will towards anybody, but you got to call it the way it is. Got to wake up. I mean, the Lord's saying, those people in your midst cause the downfall of five cities. Those people in your midst will cause the downfall of your cities. That's a corrupting influence. That's a putrefying influence that's going to rot and destroy things, right? Now, I'm not down with the guys that go street preaching hate at, at, at gay pride parades. I'm not going there either. I think that's wicked too. That's not, I'm not going there with a G-A-Y, got AIDS yet sign like I've seen guys do in the name of Jesus. That's, that's, that's wicked as hell as well, right? I believe in love and charity and forgiveness and long-suffering and grace. But when we're trying to understand the Bible and what God's doing, He's saying, hey man, that stuff's going to destroy your country. That's going to destroy your people. That's going to destroy stuff. It destroyed Greece. It destroyed Rome. It's destroyed every civilization that's ever been a part of the world. And somehow we think that we're going to end on a glorious note as we parade perversion around and call it good. It ain't going to happen. The law of sowing and reaping cannot be broken. God says you reap what you sow. That's a law. You put apple seeds in the ground, you get apples. You, put, you sow to the flesh, you're going to get corruption. That's what's going to happen. Jude 8, before my channel gets shut down. Jude 8. Um, Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. Here's the chief indicator of this satanic spiral downward. All these people, you know what they all hate? They all hate authority. They all don't want to submit to authority. They're all rebels. They despise dominion. Even Michael the archangel, when God wanted to resurrect and take Moses' body before Jesus Christ had come, it's a little vague when it happened, but clearly God took that body, took Moses, because nobody knows where Moses is buried, and the devil's like, wait a second, you can't take Moses. You can't take Moses now. He was a sinner. I know what he did. And Michael wouldn't even take the wrong authority. Even Michael said, the Lord has to rebuke you. Even Michael recognized the authority that God had that Satan never liked to acknowledge. All these guys, all these filthy dreamers, these false teachers that are likened to these people, he says they despise dominion. They hate government. They hate being under anybody's authority. That Adamic nature hates submission. But God says submit. Right? Keep going with me. Jude 11. Now we got we got the effect of apostasy, and then we got, uh, I'll call them the architects. The architects of apostasy. I mean, I spelled that wrong, I don't know. The architects, the doers, the, the villains, the ones that made it happen, right? He got Jude 11, you got three characters. They're an unholy trinity. Woe unto them! For they have gone in the way of Cain. That's your first guy. Cain. You know what Cain was? Cain was a devil. They've gone the way of Cain. These false teachers, these corruptors, these guys that want to sneak into your churches, he likens to them going the way of Cain. You know what Cain was? Cain's the first type of antichrist in your Bible. You know what he was going? He was going the wrong way. He had the wrong message. His message was salvation by works. You got to get saved by works. It's not the slaying of an innocent. No, 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 Abel. No, we're not. We're gonna. We're not, I'm not going there. We're gonna. How do you like my turnips? How do you like? How do you like them apples? Right. This is how you. By the fruit of my hands, by the work and toil of my hands, that's how you're gonna get saved. And he was promoting the wrong message. A lot of these teachers out there are preaching the wrong gospel. They're preaching works. They're preaching you can lose it. They're going in the way of Cain. They're preaching the wrong message. And I know a very big organization out there in Europe that promotes salvation by works. Whether it's Stations of the Cross or the Eightfold Path or the Five Pillars of Islam, there's only two religions in the world, gods and the devils. 
God's is salvation by grace through faith plus nothing, and everybody else is something you got to do to earn God's favor. That's the way of Cain. And these false teachers have gone the way of Cain. Don't let them infiltrate your message. We're not going to dip that color. We're going to preach the gospel is a gift by grace to all. Only Christ, only faith, only the scriptures. We're going to preach those old time things over and over again. Even if we're the last one standing, Amen. we're going to hold the fort and contend for the gospel once delivered to the saints. That truth, that salvation is by grace through faith plus nothing. That's the gospel. So what about if I... You're missing it, son. You're missing it. Not what if you... It's what did Jesus do for your what if. All right. Next character, Balaam. There's your false prophet. You know what he did? Look what it says about Balaam. It says, And ran greedily after the era of Balaam for reward. Balaam is the false prophet. He wasn't going the wrong way. He had the wrong will. He was serving for reward. Cain was preaching salvation by works. He was serving for reward. He didn't have the wrong message. He had the wrong motive. He wanted to get paid. Balaam wanted to get paid, and there's a lot of guys out there with a lot of ministries out there that just want to get paid. I remember somebody on the news confronted Kenneth Copeland at his jet, and they're looking at him on this million-dollar, somewhere, whatever, billion-dollar jet, whatever it was, and they're saying, how do, you, how do you have this jet? He's like, oh, you know, he just makes fun of the news reporter, doesn't want to talk to her. But even the world knows, what are you doing chasing a jet, bro? <laughs> What are you doing going after jets and not going after souls? The wrong motive. False prophets. We got them. Then the next character is Korah and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Korah, in this unholy trinity, is the wrong spirit. Wrong attitude. Wrong approach. Cain had the wrong way. Salvation by works, the wrong message. Balaam was the wrong will, service for reward. He had the wrong motive. But Korah had the wrong want. He was striving against authority. He had the wrong manner of spirit, the wrong attitude towards authority. Is that you? You know, when Jesus was talking to his disciples one time, he said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. Because you and I can get affected by all kinds of spirits. And in one place in the book of Job, Job asks, Whose spirit came from thee? Whose spirit came from thee? Are you under the influence of God's spirit? I hope. Your own spirit? Or the devil's spirit? Korah was rebelling against God's man and rebelling against God's authority through Moses and Aaron. And guess what? He was following a satanic spirit. That's the spirit of a rebel. Because Satan is a rebel. So that little feeling in you wants to rise up against the authorities that God had put in your life. Who do you think that came from? Not the Holy Spirit. An evil spirit. The devil spirit makes you feel that way. Let's keep going. Um, fourth chunk here. Whew. I'm burning calories. Um, then the Lord gives you, in verses 12 to, uh, 12 to 13, the illustrations. He gives you these illustrations of apostasy. What are they going to do to you? What can we compare them to? He gives you five of them, because five is the number of death. And as you spiral down, as this, as this age just circles the drain, guess what? You're going down. Notice he says in verse 12, These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. You know what they are, number one? They're spots. Now, spiritually, spots are like those selfish flies that spoil the ointment, right? There's a good spirit in the church. There's a good spirit. You know what? These little spots just seem to steal the charity, steal the joy, steal the love, steal that good spirit. That's what these folks do. But doctrinally, they're false teachers leading people to the Antichrist because the Antichrist is likened to what animal, folks? A leopard, a spotted animal with all the colors on him. Black, white, and yellow. He's got all of them. He's got the Hamite, the Shemite, and the Japhethite, all represented by this conglomerate animal called the leopard. And he's got spots, and he wants to put his spot or his mark on you. 
And these false guys are spots in your feast of charity because in the tribulation, they're leading you to take that mark and they're leading to your destruction. And James 1.27 says, you're supposed to keep yourself unspotted from the world. Don't let the spots of the Antichrist get you in the tribulation like we don't want the world to get us in this dispensation. And the devil will use those false teachers. Now we've got them today. I remember... Uh, during the lockdowns. Remember like when the lockdowns were getting released in some states and other states where it was clearly politically motivated, they kept everybody under lock and key? And most Christians that loved God, like you guys here, what did we want to do? We just wanted to have church again, right? We didn't want to, you know, hug each other and kiss. We just wanted to be sitting in a big room somewhere and be able to worship God together like the Bible says Amen. we're supposed to do. And this numbskull by the name of Andy Stanley, gets out there and says, no, 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 the Bible never says you have to assemble together. It was a whole big thing online where he was trying to make the case that no, it's okay to stay locked away and just have God on your TV. Now, I know this sometime when that has to happen. I'm not hating on that. But this guy was a false teacher trying to spread this false idea out there. And people were coming forward and saying, hey, Andy, where are you getting this from? How do you get neglect and forsake not the assembling of ourselves together? How do you... Just pretend that verse isn't in there. Just think we could all stay separated and get in front. Harold Camping was like that, the guy that used to run family radio. He was calling people. He's dead now. I hope he's in heaven, but he's probably in hell. And he's just, I don't know where he is, but he's, he said, you don't need to go to church. The churches are all apostate. Just sit in front of your radio and listen to me. Sure, let me hold on to my wallet and back away slowly because you're about to sell me a bridge, right? So... Watch out for those false teachers. The second thing he's calling, calling them in verse 12. We okay so far? Are we doing all right? Yes. I know it's a heavy book, I know. 12, he says, They're clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Clouds, you see the clouds roll up, you're expecting rain. That rain is supposed to refresh and renew and bring life. These are clouds without water. How, what good is a cloud without water? It's useless. Water is likened to the Holy Spirit in John chapter 7. These are clouds that have no Holy Spirit. They bring no refreshing, no life. There's nothing good about them. All they do is try to block out the sun from shining in your life. They're clouds without water. Then it goes on and says, They're trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. <laughs> they bring forth no fruit. There's nothing they produce that God accepts. You know what, men, if you read your Bible, they're constantly likened to trees in the Bible. And what are trees supposed to do? Bear fruit, right? You're supposed to be a tree of righteousness. You're supposed to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth His fruit in His season. That's supposed to be you. Amen? Am I talking to the right set of trees? All right, don't stand there like an oak. Just let me know. Okay, great. All right? But these men have no fruit, and they're twice dead. They're going to the lake of fire, these guys. They're not just going to die once. They're going to die twice. They're going to taste the second death. They're not saved, these guys. They're apostate. They're villains. They're trying to drag you down with them. Then it says in verse 13, they're raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. You know, I read about the waves in the Bible. The Bible says the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. These guys are wicked. They're wicked. They have no rest. The Bible says, He that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. You know what these guys are going to do to you? These guys don't ground you. They make you unstable like they are. That you get under good, solid Bible teaching. You go through discipleship one, discipleship two. You know what that's supposed to do? It grounds you. It settles you. It makes it so all the crazy ideas out there can't toss you to and fro anymore. But you get under false teaching, they'll turn your head inside out. 
that make you wondering, you know, does elect mean elect? Does chosen mean chosen? Does will mean will? Does this mean that? And all these fair words and dark speeches, they'll try to confuse you with, with these big words when the God said, no, I want to ground you. I want to settle you. But these liars want you to be just like them, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. They're raging waves of the sea. And last thing they are is in 13. It says they're wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. You know what you need the stars for in biblical times? To navigate by. You'd see that north star and it wasn't moving around and you can navigate your ship by that star. These are wandering stars. They're not fixed. They're not settled. You can't navigate by them. If you follow them, you're going to get lost and crash into the rock somewhere and end up in the dark. That's what these guys are going to take you. And finally, 14 to 19, the last chunk. All right, I don't have room to write this, so I'm just going to give it. This is the last chunk, and then we'll wrap it up. This is the final warning. Danny stepped out to go to the bathroom, but I would have imitated him. This is your final warning, right? This is that's his famous uh, street preaching line. So this is, he's going to end the section with the final warning about falling away. Look at verse 14. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Notice this is the only book that mentions, one, the strife over Moses' body in verse 9, and Enoch preaching and prophesying in verse 14. Nothing else in the Bible about that, but except here in the book of Jude. Keep reading. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These men are ungodly. Do you think God's trying to make a point? I think he says the word ungodly four times in that one verse. These are ungodly men. They're against God. And he's saying that as far back as Enoch, he was preaching, payday's coming for you guys. When Jesus Christ comes, you know who's afraid more than anybody? The false teachers. The Pharisees, they're the ones that are shaking in their boots. You read through Exodus, you read through Ezekiel, you know what God's prophesying judgment upon? The false teachers, the false pastors, the ones that were supposed to know better and feed the flock and took advantage of them. God says, I'm going to get you guys. And he's saying, you false teachers, you false prophets, when I come back, I'm going to execute my judgment upon you, and payday's going to come someday. What else does he say about these guys? Verse 16, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Please notice, they murmur and complain because they're driven by their appetites. They're not driven by the Lord. You know who makes you complain a lot? Satan's the complainer. Amen. Oh, God gave you everything but that one tree. That's Satan. God says, hey man, you got everything. Of all the trees thou mayest freely eat. The Holy Spirit leads you to thankfulness and gratitude and joy and all that stuff. Not, not, not complaining and misery. All right. Notice it says in verse 18, how that the Lord, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. They're mockers. They make fun of God's truth. You know some of the stuff you believe? You, you Neanderthal numbskulls, you think God preserved a book? You dumb country bumpkins. You think, you think God just dumb preserved one Bible, right? You hicks. Right? That's what they, you think, you don't understand all the stuff they understand, right? You believe in God, you know, the atheists laugh at you. Oh, you believe in God. You be, what do you believe in, a rock? No, you got a head like a rock. That's what you got. That's what you got, right? And they want to make funny, that, oh, you believe God. You believe God hung the stars and couldn't fix a word on a page? I know, you got the wrong God. We got a different God. Amen. You think God could keep you, but you can't keep John 3.16? Come on, man. Come on. Hey, come on, man. Right? So, um... They mock the second coming. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. And the world's full of mockers. Even among God's people, you got mockers. If you told most of your Christian friends that go to contemporary churches the stuff you believe in your statement of faith, they'd step away from you. They'd be like, whoa, you're crazy. You're extreme. Right? I just wanted Jesus to be the sprinkles on my Sunday. Right? 
2 Peter 3, verse uh, 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, mockers, walking after their own lusts. Sounds just like Jude and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. See, 2 Peter gives the same kind of warning. Peter's influence in Jude. You know what Psalm 1 says? Sure you do. Quote it for me. No. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. You see, when you start walking in the counsel of the ungodly, you're going to end up sitting in the seat of the scornful. And you might be, you turn away from God and you start following the wrong counsel, you may end up making fun of the doctrines that you once said amen to in church. You may be, oh yeah, that Bible, I used to sing that song. I used to believe that way. You watch people that start following the wrong spirit, following the wrong counsel, following the wrong advice. They end up sitting in the seat of the scornful, mocking just like these guys. That's the spirit. That's the spirit of the age. Verse, go back to Jude and look at verse 19. Jude 19. <clears throat> These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. These guys we're talking about, they look really spiritual, but they're really sensual. You know who's sensual? My dog is sensual. He lives by his senses, by his urges. A beast is sensual. They just follow their feelings, their appetites, their instincts, their, their desires, their lusts, their belly, and other things. That's what they follow. They're sensual. They're called beasts. These guys are called beasts in verse 10. They're as brute beasts. They're like animals just <laughs> sniffing around for something. They're like animals. Now, Proverbs 18 says, A man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth in all wisdom. You know, a man can separate himself and say, look, I've set myself apart for God. That's religion. You know what that does? It exalts self. Look at me. Look at me. Look what I've done. Look who I've separated. Look how I'm different from you. Look who I'm higher than you. Look who I'm so pious and spiritual. That's a man separating himself. That exalts self. In Acts chapter 13, the Holy Spirit says, separate unto me, Saul and Barnabas, for the work whereunto I have called them. The Holy Spirit can separate you unto God. When the Holy Spirit separates you, that exalts the Savior. Amen. When you separate yourself, that exalts you. Right. And these men, it says in verse 19, they separate themselves. They've made themselves in this elite class of super spiritual giants, but they're really just exalting self. When the Holy Spirit separates you for work, then God exalts His Son through the Holy Spirit of God. So let's finish up, right? Let's stay right there. Oh, man, talk about falling away, all right? I'll be here all week. All right, so just go to verses 20 to 25. We talked about the, the command and the caution. Most of the book is caution. And now these last few verses are the comfort. And here's the big idea. Despite the apostasy all around you, you could keep yourself from falling away. To me, that's good news. Hey. Despite the apostasy all around you, and as we sing that song, mighty men around us falling, courage almost gone, we can hold the fort. Amen. And you could keep yourself from falling away. You can't stop the apostasy from happening. 2 Thessalonians 2.3 says, Before Jesus comes, a great falling away will come first. The church age ends in apostasy. But you could be a Philadelphian Christian in a Laodicean age, Amen. and the book of Jude ends with the comfort of telling you how. So we'll end on a positive. We'll end on a good note. After 50 minutes of me body slamming you all over around the room and giving you all this heavy stuff, the book ends on a very positive note, how you could keep yourself from being part of this mess. It's right here. He says, you can keep yourself in the faith, and it gives you seven things, and I'll just run through them, seven things to keep yourself from falling. Verse 20 is the first one. He says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith. The first thing is you got to keep building. Got to keep building yourself up, folks. Nobody's arrived, Amen. even a head deacon's son. Nobody has actually ever made it. Nobody can ever say, like, All right, now, 
I could just sit on the lounge chair of Christianity and sip the tea by the poolside where everybody else just struggles to get where I am. Nobody's ever there. Nobody's ever arrived. You got to keep growing in grace. Got to keep growing in knowledge. Got to keep trying to get closer, higher, less of self, more of him, more about Jesus. That's what you got to build. If you stop building, the word backslider is not in the Bible. Backslider. Well, I should say it this way. It's not, people say, I'm in a backslidden condition, as if you slid down the alley, you slid down the mountain and just stopped. No, backsliding, backslider, that means you just keep sliding backwards. If you're not going forward, you're going backwards. There's no middle ground, so you've got to keep building if you want to keep yourself in the faith. Number two, he says, praying in the Holy Ghost. You've got to keep praying, because those prayers are like the tears that water the seed to help things grow. Amen. So you got to be building yourselves up, praying things up, praying about everything. Juliet had that speech. She's going to do it, Lord willing, on Monday. I said, oh, five more days to pray it up. <laughs> five more days to bathe that thing in prayer. Just pray it up, man. Pray about everything. Because you know what? It's, it's hard to get far from God when you bow your heart to pray. Hard to stay mad at a brother or sister when you pray for them. Hard to be angry at that neighbor who's lost when you bow your head and remember they're going to burn in the devil's hell. Lord, save their soul. Praying is very, very powerful. It'll melt your heart. Amen. Number three, he says in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. You got to be building. You got to be praying. You got to be keeping. You got to be getting lost in his love. You got to keep yourself up. You got to let yourself get lost in his love, man. Don't move from that spot. Remember what it was like 15 minutes after you got saved? Amen. Right? That, that, like, that high, that, like, whoa, like when it really hit you, like, Amen. whoa, you know, and you're like, you know, sat on the bus next to people that were all lost, and you were like, whoa, all these people are lost, I can talk to all of them, you know, and you're just like, whoa, you know, and one after another you started doing that because it hits you like, whoa, they're all, whoa, I mean, remember that, that, that amazing, Amen. keep yourself in that love, don't move away from that, don't let the world just carry you away from that, make you cold and hard. And, and apathetic. No, keep yourselves in the love of God. Number four, he says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. You got to be building, you got to be praying, you got to be keeping, and you got to be looking. You should be looking forward to that day, looking forward to the day when Jesus Christ comes. Are you living in anticipation of the Lord's return? Building up, praying up, keeping up, looking up. The Bible says, lift up your heads, for now your salvation is nearer than when you believed. Right? How about 22? He says, and of some have compassion, making a difference. Hey, are you helping? You helping somebody? Helping, right? Helping people and having compassion when it's time to have compassion. You know, you go to that rescue mission tomorrow night and the guy's broken down on his luck and he's looking for answers. You're not going to break that guy's neck with the Ten Commandments. You're going to try to pour some grace in, pray with that guy, try to help him. There's a time for compassion. We should be the most compassionate people around. Hey, it's easy to stay in the faith when you're helping people with the things of God. So are you helping anybody else besides yourself? How about number five? 23, and, of, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Notice he says next, are you, are you trying to save, save anybody, see anybody get saved? He says, you know, others save with fear. Are you trying to get souls saved from the fire? Sometimes it's sweet and it's sugary, and somebody like uh, Lewis, who came a few weeks ago and got saved, man, we sat down in the art room, that guy was probably saved before he sat down. We sat down, we asked him, why do you want to get to heaven? He just burst out in tears and was just like so open. I, I didn't have to convince him he was a sinner. He knew he was a sinner. He just was like, how do I get, how do I let the, you know, how do I get, how do I, he just, you know, that, that's compassion. Some people, you got to shut their mouths. Amen. You got to show them that they're wrong, that God is angry with the wicked. And why? Because you know what they don't know, that they're headed right off a cliff, right. that they're going right into hell. They're going to burn. Those people that mock God, folks, all around you, they're going to burn. Right. They're going to burn. 
their souls are going to burn. I heard a preacher one time, Earl Ankrum, say, imagine looking at people around you, seeing them burn, seeing them consumed by the fire, seeing their souls just agonizing. Let that melt your heart, right? The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom. It's the way it lets men depart from evil. So sometimes you've got to put the fear of God on people. And it's a great time to do that. You know, somebody at my job the other day was like, uh, all this stuff happening. I was trying to like work in some prophecy, work some stuff in. I said, well, what do I got to do? And I kind of said nicely with a smile, you really got to have your come to Jesus moment, you know, before that all happens. You know, because sometimes you got to let that fear get people's attention. And the last thing, and this is, this is great to end on, talk about positive. Are you hating the right things? See what it says at the end? This is number seven. It says, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Are you hating this flesh enough to save your garment from its spots? Are you tired of your lies and tired of your lust and tired of your appetites and tired of your unbelief? You know, you got to get so sick of this flesh that you don't want to give it any more room in your life that it can't steal anything more from God because it's taken so much. You're like, I don't want it to take any more. That's how you got to get if you're going to stay in the faith and not be part of the great falling away. Now, in the Great Tribulation, those spots are connected to the Antichrist mark that damns a soul. But today, the flesh can spot your garment and damn your life. Don't let that flesh destroy your life or anybody else's. And then he ends with this great thing. This is what you do. You do these seven things. And if you do these seven things, here's what God does in verse 24. Verse 24, he says, Now, if you've done these seven things, if you've kept growing, praying, keeping yourself in the love of God, looking for His return, helping others, helping others get saved, hating the wrong things, and just done the things God said to do, he says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. What is he saying? If you do what God says to do, if you keep yourself, the Lord will keep you. If you do what God says to do, He says, I'll do what I said I'd do. You follow the plan, I'll take care of you. You keep yourself in the love of God. You keep doing the things I said to do. I'll keep you from falling. That scares me. I was just talking about Josh before we had service today. That's my biggest fear is being one of those castaways. Right. Being one of those guys that used to take a seat up. Be one of those people that used to be in ministry and now, oh, where are they? Oh, they're just a bad example right. in a sermon. That scares me to death. Right. And you think, like it, you think it's capricious. You think it's just random. Like, will it land on me? Will it fall on me? Will those bad heebie-jeebies take me out next? No, they don't have to take you out. If you do the things God says to do, God will keep you from falling. That's blessed insurance. That's blessed assurance. So if you draw nigh to God, what's He say? I'll draw nigh to you, you and keep you from falling. Let's pray. Lord, we love you today. We thank you. Thank you for this great book. Thank you for these great truths, Lord. Uh, if I said anything wrong, Lord, just forgive me, but I pray we'd be impressed with the fact that though things are falling apart around us, we could stand, and having done all, stand. Father, help us to have that courage to stand, to just take you at your word. Father, do the things you said to do, and we trust you, Father, that you'll keep your promise and keep your end of the bargain, Father. We thank you for being a God that always keeps His promise, who cannot lie. It's impossible for you to lie, Father. So help these people walk out of here knowing that if we'll just do the things you told us to do, you can keep us from being a castaway in this evil age. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.